typically think of some sort of physical commodity, a coin, a bill, some other promissory type note. But it turns out there's an entirely different way to view money. Instead of having a physical object that we have, we could instead all have a giant ledger that we all share. And that every time someone spends money, we record that this person gave money to this person. So there's never any physical, actual coins in existence. It's just this big ledger. Well, you have a problem now. How do you keep the religion department from faking the ledger? No. How do, you, how do you keep anyone from faking the ledger and saying, no, 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 this is the ledger. No, no, this is the ledger. This is the ledger. How do you secure a publicly held ledger? This is actually the problem with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a rather stellar idea in some ways. We're almost there. Wow. Instead of having physical individual coins, there's just a big ledger that is publicly held. There's no central authority. There's no persistent coins. And when I have my presentation, <laughs> you'll see some of this again. Security. That's a big deal. The target hack has re-emphasized in society how important security is. IT security uh, in general is not great, but that's an entirely different set of talks. You want single spend, right? If you have a digital currency, well, I can copy my hard drive. I now have a copy of that coin. How can I only spend that once? Well, this is where the ledger idea comes in, right? If we all have the same ledger that we agree upon and the ledger's hard to fake, then, once it's spent in the ledger, what I've spent is spent. Authentication. We need to know for certain that I am the owner, that the owner of the coin is the one spending the coin. And anonymity. Oh, sorry, also authentication. You cannot deny receiving the money. Yeah, that's a big deal, right? We can't have someone say, whoa, 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 I never got that. Well, again, in the ledger, it's all there. And anonymity. You don't want to be able to determine the owners of, of individual uh, coins just from the ledger itself. So a little bit of the history of Bitcoin. In 2008, a person by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper on the internet called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. He, he submitted this to a conference. Um, supposedly the founder's been found, but there's lots of questions surrounding that. Uh, we're not 100% certain that that is the person who founded this. Uh, for a long time, the name Satoshi Nakamoto was Sato Satoshi Nakamoto was actually considered um, a pseudonym. So it's it's an interesting question over who actually started this. January 2009, the Bitcoin network came into existence. So I'm going to finally finish coding it up. And November 29, 2013. Bitcoin hits a value of $1,124.75. I hope you sold that. <laughs> I, I think they're hovering about 300 today. So, All right, so what about the design of the algorithm? Well, I've spoken a little bit about this already. But the big deal is, it's simply a ledger. All it is, is a ledger of who paid who. 
who paid whom. There are no persistent coins. There's no central authority. This is one of the neater aspects. Since it's a publicly maintained ledger, you don't need some central authority keeping the master copy of the ledger. There is, in fact, no master copy. Every copy, well, actually, the majority of copies are considered the master copy, but they all need to have a certain set of properties that make them very, very difficult to fake. The ledgers themselves are called blocks, and every user is able to actually maintain a copy of these blocks. The block ledger is currently about 11 megabytes, so it's really not that much. So, what is a Bitcoin? A Bitcoin itself, then, is a chain of signed and verified transactions in the blocks. I'll go over a bit more about how the individual transactions occur and how the blocks themselves are generated. So when you spend a Bitcoin, what do you do? You go into the network, you grab blocks that have been paid to you, you take those, you combine them into a single unit, you, get, you specify who you're giving money to, and then the rest is given to you in change. You broadcast this out to the network, it gets incorporated into the ledger, and then certain properties are developed. I can't know try and get to those. As long as enough people are honest, this system works great. And really what you need is at least, I think it's 33% of people have to be honest. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, 66%, not 33. 66% need to be honest for the system to work. <clears throat> so how does, the, how does this work, actually? Well, you grab your transaction blocks paying to you, you insert your payees, your, pay, your payee's public key. So every person generates a public and a private key. You broadcast your public key, you keep your secret key absolutely secret. You never, ever reveal your secret key. If you do, anyone can spend your bitcoins. They're gone. But, you, but the public key, it turns out the public key and the private key can't be derived from each other easily without knowing some secrets. You run it through an algorithm. The algorithm takes quite a bit to discuss, so we'll just call it an algorithm. <laughs> and this spits out some pseudo-random output. You then sign this with your private key. And this is you saying, yes, I intend to spend this. And then you send this out to the network. How do we prevent double spending? This is one of the bigger problems when you're dealing with an electronic currency. So we broadcast our transaction to the network. The transactions, all the transactions from a 10 minute period are grouped together into what is called a block. <coughs> then the transactions in the block are, well, something's done with them called hashing. A hash function is a function that is very easy to compute in one direction and incredibly difficult to compute in the other direction. In general, a hash function looks like random noise as you put values into it. So if you put the same value in twice, you get the same value out twice. But two neighboring values, the outputs may not be even close together, or they're completely unrelated. It looks like random noise, and that's one of the design considerations of a hash function. <coughs> What we need to do then is we need to timestamp this to verify, yes, this transaction occurred at this time. And so all the transactions come in from a 10 minute period. They're all run through a hash function together. And then we search for a special value that when we put it in, we get certain output properties. And the output properties for Bitcoin is you're looking for a value that gives you your output as a certain number of zeros at the beginning. It turns out this is actually a quote-unquote difficult problem. In fact, the growth of this problem is exponential. In other words, if finding an answer takes an average 10 minutes with current computing technology, the next step of the problem, so if we want to crank up the add one more zero, it now takes on average 20 minutes to solve that problem. If we crank it up one more time, it takes on average 40 minutes. So this was one of the design considerations. So as hardware improves, they slowly increase the number of leading zeros you need. 
to make the problem more difficult. Their goal is to have it take, on average, 10 minutes for this verification. Once the series of blocks is generated, catching up is difficult. And this is why, or this is how we prevent the ledger from being faked. Right? If it takes me 10 minutes to generate a block, and now I'm two blocks behind the network, I can never catch up. Because as I take the 10 minutes to fake a block, the networks move forward 10 minutes. And every time I take a step forward, the network is also taking a step forward. And this is assuming I have half the computing power, or half the computing power that the network has. <coughs> if I have any less than that, it's much, much more difficult to fake. So how, how is an actual block created? We take all the previous transactions and the pays public keys. We run them through a hash function. This is what we did before. We spit this out, and we apply our private key. Then we broadcast this to the network. The network then takes all of the transactions that have come in for the last 10 minutes, and it runs them through a hash function. Then the goal is to search for, oh, sorry, we run the previous blocks in also, so that it depends upon what was spent previously. And then we search for what's called a nonce. This is the value that, that when we find it, gives us the certain number of zeros at the beginning. This is the hard problem. This is what makes the whole system work. Once we find that value, we broadcast that, and that becomes a block. The thing that's interesting is it's very, very easy to verify that a block is correct and valid. It is very, very difficult to forge a block. Thank you. So who creates the blocks? Every, everyone in the network is simultaneously trying to create the block. Those that want to. Those that want to. Whoever finds the nonce that creates the block <coughs> is rewarded with 25 Bitcoin. So you, you get paid for finding this. Where does the like history of transactions live? Or does it live? Or is it always kind of rewriting over itself? Like can I if I you know, can I go back and be like, oh I paid with Bitcoin like three years ago? You know, yeah. You Where does do that live? You would you would keep a copy of that ledger. Okay, so like So so this is the transaction ledger I was talking about. That's about ten megabytes. Maybe 11 now. It was 10 megabytes back in February. Like it's maybe 11 at this point. So I mean, it's a very, very small file, but uh, you would keep a copy of that yourself then. Without people being able to go back in and like change well, no, it. And without, yeah, people can't go back and change it and fake it. Okay. Because, because of this catch up property. Oh. One of the two. Yeah, so <clears throat> it does seem like uh, using. Bitcoin uh, currency could be very, very helpful, you know, for instance, in avoiding transaction fees or service fees, something like that. Uh, but it does seem to be particularly weak, uh, weak in the sense that it relies on what that critical mass of 66% to tell the truth uh, for right. it to operate. <laughs> so, so there are actually sociologists looking into this um, because it's actually a very interesting experiment in terms of social or of a collective behavior. Um, so yeah, Bitcoin itself relies on a pretty large number of users, to be honest. But yeah, but but the, but the trade-off is there's no central authority that can arbitrarily change the rules. Also, so. <laughs> <laughs> two questions: Do you have Bitcoins yourself? No. One question. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to ask for your private key. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. How about taxation? Let's see, I was just informed that the IRS has decided that Bitcoin is an investment and not a currency. So I think there is taxation involved in this. 
with the uh, taxation. I thought one of the <coughs> benefits of Bitcoin was uh, it's untraceable in terms of who's using it and who's who's spending and receiving the money. So how would there be any tax? There would be taxes if you converted it back into dollars. Right, that's that's the issue, right? A, a, as is, bitcoins themselves, yeah, are well, in, in theory, untrace, untraceable, and you can't tell who owns them. Um, it, it turns out that problem's not as clear cut either. Just an interesting comment. I heard on the radio the other day that there is now a Bitcoin ATM available at South Station. Oh uh, yeah, and there's been the one in Harvard Square for quite a while already. So, Christian Bardew, what hardware is necessary? this be a cell phone to cell phone transaction or for, for doing the basic transactions yeah a cell phone can do it <clears throat> um, for mining the bitcoins currently to to really even have a chance you need application specific hardware like you need hardware that's been built from the ground up to do nothing but solving this problem Anonymity can be a you know a great you know asset, but it can also be a terrific liability, particularly in this like age of heightened awareness about terrorism and things like that. So, what's the conversation uh, right now with regard to terrorism and untraceable financial transactions in Bitcoin? I have no idea. <laughs> All right. I, I I care more about the security and the math <laughs> right. than, the, than the implications. So. Yeah, they don't matter. They matter, but no, I, know, I, know. I have plenty of time. Yes. Yeah. Um, other than the fact that Bitcoin is untraceable, what makes it more productive or efficient as compared to a credit card or debit card? Well, first of all, there's no central authority. With a with credit card, you have to go through your central authority, which is the bank that has issued the credit card to you. Um, the other thing is, since there never is a physical object linked to it, um, you only are, the, the transfers are easy. Once it's transferred, it's transferred, right? It's not that I, it's been transferred to this bank and then I can draw on that bank the money, right? Once it's transferred to you, it's transferred to you, you own it, right? So that's, it makes transfer very, very easy. It's a good question. I mean, and then the, the, I would love to know the answer myself. <laughs> I, I put little to no thought into that. Last yeah. question. Oh, all right, I may have missed it earlier, but um, how much is one block or one Bitcoin? Uh, currently, I think they're trading for $300. $300 per Bitcoin? Yeah, you, you can just, it, it's, it's publicly traded a lot, so you can just Google the value. Thank you.